We'll have people coming in, so we're just going to hang on for another minute. All right, and get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Wendy Kamasar, Instructor and Research Specialist at the Howard County Library System Central Branch. Please note this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube page within the next couple of weeks. We're so happy to have you with us tonight for Landlord Tenant Law, Know Your Rights and Responsibilities, presented by our partners at the Howard County Office of Consumer Protection a division of the Howard County Department of Community Resources and Services. They help protect Howard County consumers by mediating disputes, assist in smart purchasing decisions, how to take enforcement action, and provide tips on how to avoid scams. Uh, this webinar will be offered in Korean on Zoom on February 6th and in Spanish in person at the Central Branch on February 13th. And we will put those links in the chat box, um, but you can register for them on our website as well. Our guest presenter tonight is Beth Silverman. Beth has been working in the field of consumer protection for over 20 years. She is currently an investigator with the Howard County Office of Consumer Protection. If you have any questions or comments during the pres presentation, feel free to leave them in the chat box below. And uh, Thank you so much for being here with us tonight, Beth. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see everybody virtually. We're glad you're able to join us today. Um, as uh, Wendy said, I am with the Howard County Office of Consumer Protection. And she did talk a little bit about what the office does. So we do try and um, help, help keep consumers safe in the marketplace in Howard County. We try and handle disputes between merchants and consumers and landlords and tenants. Um, we provide information and ans answer questions by phone, email, and in person. If you have anything that you want to know, we're happy to talk to you. We enforce the consumer county's consumer laws, and we do education and outreach like we're doing here tonight to try and educate people about their rights as, as consumers. Um, <clears throat> I understand that there are people from all over here, all over the state today here that might be with us today. If you are not from Howard County and you're from a different county, we'd really like to know that. If you could put in the chat what county that you're from, that would be wonderful. Um, primarily what we're going to be talking about is uh, laws that involve the state of Maryland. The state of Maryland overseas has the, the main uh, landlord tenant laws for the state. Howard County does have its own law that adds on to that. So I'll be uh, going through the difference between what's the state and what's Howard County. And we'll talk about those different things in terms of the, the uh, statutes. So we're gonna sort of go through uh, all the Howard, all the basic landlord tenant stuff. So we're gonna get started. The main <clears throat> agreement between a landlord and a tenant is a lease. So the lease is a contract between the landlord and tenant the tenant agrees to pay rent for the property and the landlord agrees to provide that property in a habitable environment and with other conditions. And the uh, lease goes through uh, what those conditions are and what the agreement is between both sides. And both sides are bound by the, by the lease and what it says in the lease. So the most important thing that we can tell you tonight is always get your lease in writing and always read it before you sign it. Very important to understand what you're agreeing to because once you've signed the lease, you're agreeing to those tenants in the lease. <clears throat> so what does a lease include? It includes basic information, the length of the lease term. So most leases are a year, but, they're, but a lease can be anything. It can be, a, I've seen two year leases, six month leases, month to month leases, 
whatever the, the agreement is between the two parties, that's up to them, but the length is the first thing that's in there. When, when the rent is due, generally that's on the first, but for some leases it's not. It might be in the middle of the month or it depends on you know, what, the, what the agreement is between both the parties. Of course, the amount of rent to be paid, the name of all the tenants and the address of the property has to be included in the lease, as well as the name and address and phone number of the landlord, or the landlord may have a property management company that's um, working out that's taking care of the property. And so that information is gonna be on there if there's someone else to contact on behalf of the landlord, if the landlord has having uh, somebody manage the property for them. The amount of the security deposit needs to be in the lease. We're gonna talk more about security deposits in a couple of minutes, but just as a brief thing that the security deposit can only be up to two months rent. In addition, the amount of notice that must be given by the tenant or the landlord to terminate a lease if the lease contains an automatic renewal clause. Again, we're going to go in more into what automatic renewal clauses are and how that works in a couple of minutes, but this is just a basic overview of the things that we want to have in a lease. Another part of the lease is who pays for what. So there is rent, but there's also um, utilities and maybe uh, trash collection or other services that are provided. And so a lease has to clearly state what is the tenant's obligation for utilities and what is the landlord's obligation for utilities. And when you're looking at a lease and you're looking to rent a place, you want to look at, you know, what is, as a tenant, what you're obligated to pay and how that might add to the rent. As I was mentioning earlier, the landlord-tenant relations are governed by the Maryland Landlord-Tenant Act. Um, and then in 2018, Howard County passed its own landlord-tenant law, and that adds to the, uh, the state law. If you're not in Howard County, your, your county may have its own laws that uh, add to the state law. You're going to have to check with your own county for that information and see if there's that there. But I'm going to talk a little bit now about some of the things that are in the Howard County law that are not in the Maryland state law. So in the county law, the landlord must inform the tenant that they can they have to give 24 hour notice to enter the property. Um, 24 hours are mutually agreed upon time and the tenant has to be agreeable to allow the landlord to come in if there, if there needs to be repairs or improvements or if there's an inspection, a county inspection or to show dwelling to prospective buyers or renters the landlord has to give that 24 hour notice and the tenant has to be fairly agreeable to allowing them to do that. The landlord and tenant may agree to shorter notice if that works for both of them. Uh, and as I said, the, the tenant may not reasonably refuse the landlord to enter the property. This doesn't hold true for emergencies, of course. A landlord may enter without notice if there is an emergency. Um, or if there's some damage to the unit or a violation of the lease that the landlord needs to take action on. <clears throat> so in the Maryland law, there is one condition where it says that a tenant may terminate their lease with 60 days written notice and not be held liable for two months of rent to break a lease if that tenant has needs, medical needs, that, allow, that mean that they can no longer live in that unit. So if a tenant needs a, a higher level of care, then they can be, you know, the medically that they need that, then they're allowed to give that kind of notice. And that's in the Maryland state law. Howard County has added two other types of reasons why tenants can break their lease uh, with this provision of the 60 day notice and be held liable for no more than two months. If the tenant has an involuntary change of employment, that means they need to move 100 miles away or more, or if the wage earner whose income was used to qualify for the place um, becomes involuntarily unemployed or passes away. Howard County also requires that the lease provide information if a ratio unit billing system is used. And that's used for properties where each individual unit is not individually metered, but instead the building has one meter and then the utilities are divided up between the tenants. So if that system used, which is called a rub system, then information on that system has to be disclosed to the tenant 
so that they know exactly how that um, information is calculated and how uh, they're going to get billed for that their portion of that. Um, and the calculations cannot include common areas or administrative areas. Uh, they can only, tenants can only be billed for tenant property. So what are some exceptions, things that are not allowed in a lease? So the Maryland law states that a lease cannot impose a late fee as long as payment is made within five days of the due date. So most leases are the first of the month. And so if a tenant pays by the fifth of the month, they don't get a late fee. The late fee cannot be more than 5% of the rent. And then also leases uh, have to state uh, that the landlord has to give a minimum of 30 days notice if they're going to be terminating the lease. A few other things in Howard County. A Howard County lease may not require that a tenant agrees to pay any court costs or legal fees, except those that are awarded by the court. Also, landlords cannot terminate a lease in retaliation against um, a tenant joining a tenant or rights organization. So automatic renewal clauses, and again, this is for the whole Maryland state. We talked earlier about automatic renewal clauses, and the way they work is most leases at the end of the lease term, so let's say it's a year lease, the year goes and that lease automatically renews unless either party, either the landlord or the tenant, give notice that they're not renewing the lease. And then the lease can then automatically renew for another year or it can renew on a month to month basis, but that information has to be put into the lease. And that clause that gives the information on the automatic renewal clause has to be a separate paragraph. And that also has, a, has to have a place for the tenant to initial or sign that they've seen that particular paragraph. So we want people to really understand what the automatic renewal lease causes and the amount of notice they need to give about that if they're not going to be renewing, because that's a really important part of any lease. If the lease does have an automatic renewal clause, and let's say that renewal clause says that the tenant or landlord has to give 60 days notice if they're not going to renew. In that case, the landlord has to give more than 60 days notice to the tenant if the landlord is going to increase the rent. That gives the tenant an opportunity to think about whether or not they want to accept that rent increase or if they're not comfortable with the rent increase, then they can give proper notice that they're not going to be renewing their lease through the automatic renewal clause. Security deposits are another big topic with leases. As I said earlier, a landlord may not charge any more than two months rent as a security deposit. And that includes if there's a pet deposit or any other kind of deposit, Altogether, it cannot be more than two months rent. The landlord has to hold that money in escrow during the lease term so that it's available when the tenant moves out. The landlord also has to give the tenant a receipt for the payment of the, of the security deposit. Mostly that receipt is given in the lease itself. So there's a portion of the lease that says security deposit and it states how much deposit was given and that works as both the lease and the receipt for the deposit that, you, that the tenant has given. There's other information about security deposit law that also needs to be included in the lease. And generally, most leases have all that in one section. When a tenant moves out and the security deposit needs to be returned, that's another big part of the law for landlord tenants. The landlord has to return the tenant security deposit within 45 days after the tenant vacates the property, plus they have to pay the applicable interest. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, if the landlord withholds any part of the deposit, the landlord has to send a letter to the tenant showing here's the amount of your security deposit, here's the amount of your interest, and here's what I'm deducting from your deposit and why. So it has to be very clear what damages that the landlord is holding the, the tenant to, and they can only charge the actual cost of repairs. 
So landlords need to be able to back up those charges with receipts, showing here's what we paid to fix that problem. And so the letter is clearly showing this is what we this is what you're being charged for. And then at the end, either this is the money you're getting back that, that's left over, or this is the money that you still owe us because the damages that are in the property exceeded the amount of your deposit. And if the landlord fails to send that letter, the landlord forfeits any keeping any amount of the security deposit. So it's 45 days from the day of vacation that the tenant vacates that all this information has to go to the tenant. So a landlord can, can take money from the security deposit for a variety of reasons. So one of them is if there's unpaid rent and the other one is for damages to the unit. This is a, unfortunately a bit of a gray area. What is damage? What is normal wear and tear? But we try and look at it as like, let's take a carpet for instance. If this is a carpet that gets walked on for five years, that's normal wear and tear. If the carpet has a rip in it or a stain, that's damage. So the landlord is allowed to uh, fix damages and charge the tenant for it, but not for normal wear and tear. We always recommend that all tenants request to be present for a final walkthrough at the end of the tenancy. Maryland state law says that a tenant has to request that by certified mail. Now, certified mail is not used as much anymore that we have email and other methods of communication. So there are some landlords that don't require that anymore. But if you're a tenant, I would talk to your landlord and make sure that you're requesting to be present for the walkthrough in the method that they that they require. They may still require the certified mail. They may say, no, it's fine if you, you know, just send us an email. But that's something that you want to make sure that you're doing correctly because you want to make sure to be there for that walkthrough so you can see what they're saying is damage and make sure that you understand what's happening. Just earlier, I mentioned that the landlord has to return the security deposit plus interest. So in 2015, the amount of interest that the landlord has to give the tenant decreased because um, you know, banks weren't paying the high interest. And currently it's about 1.5%. It's now calculated, as you can see on the PowerPoint, it's calculated as the greater of the daily US Treasury curve yield. Fortunately, you don't need to know what that means. I don't know what that means because, oops, I'm so sorry. Okay. Technical difficulty, sorry about that. Um, the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development has a calculator on its website. So they keep track of what the interest is supposed to be and if it changes based on this treasury yield curve. Um, but all you have to do is go to that website and the landlord or the tenant, you plug in the information that they request, which is the amount of, you know, the rent and the dates of moving in and leaving. And that uh, calculator calculates the amount of interest for you. So it's very easy to do. Another big uh, topic is early termination. So sometimes tenants have to leave before the end of the lease. And that's a tough one because a tenant has signed an agreement, signed a contract saying, I'm going to be here for this amount of time. And if they want to move out before the end of the lease, the landlord is allowed to hold them to that lease for the remainder of the term. However, the landlord is required to attempt to mitigate the damages for the tenant. And what that means is that the landlord has to allow that, put that unit back up for rent. So let's say a tenant has to move out four months early, but the landlord is able to re-rent that unit in so that two of those months, they're now having a new tenant in there. So that means you can only hold the original tenant for two months of rent. A landlord can't take rent from two parties at the same time. So by mitigating the damages, they try and reduce the amount that the tenant owes if something requires them to move out early. So eviction is gonna be our next topic. 
Um, and landlords can evict for a variety of reasons. They can try and evict a tenant for non-payment of rent. Also, if a tenant doesn't move at the end of the term, so let's say that the lease ends and the tenant decides or hasn't, you know, for whatever reason, doesn't leave, that's called a tenant holding over. And the landlord can try and go for an eviction for that reason. Or if, a, or if a tenant breaches any terms of the lease. So if there are rules and regulations in the lease itself that the tenant has agreed to and that they are not abiding by, the landlord can go to court for, to evict for those reasons as well. The landlord cannot evict solely because the tenant has filed a complaint, filed a lawsuit or a complaint with a public agency like our office or the attorney general's office or any other county uh, or government agency. So that's not a reason to evict. Eviction is a very specific legal process. It's done through the court and in order for an eviction to go through, it must actually um, go through and have a hearing in front of a judge who orders the eviction. If a landlord is currently trying to evict for non-payment of rent, um, there is a new law that says that before the landlord can file in court, they have to give a notice that their file intent to file to the tenant showing the amount that the tenant owes and giving them 10 days to pay. If the tenant pays within the 10 days, then the landlord doesn't go to court. Um, but if the tenant doesn't, then at that time, after those 10 days, um, the landlord can go to court and file for the eviction. A landlord may not remove belongings or change locks or do anything without an order of eviction. And you certainly won't see a sheriff coming to the house or doing anything again until that order of eviction is signed. Licensing. So in Howard County, all landlords have to have a license from the Howard County Department of Licensing, Inspections and Permits prior to renting out their property. I assume that most other counties are similar, um, but if you're in another county, you're gonna wanna talk to your county or find out from your county exactly how that works. Also in Howard County, with our law, not only is the landlord need to be licensed, but they need to make sure that the tenant is aware that they're licensed and that they can inspect the license if, if they so choose. Also, if a landlord doesn't re um, renew their license correctly, a tenant may terminate their lease without penalty at any time if a landlord is unlicensed. And then as soon as the landlord gets licensed again, then we're back to um, following the, the lease. If you have questions on obtaining a license or checking to see if your landlord has a license, you're gonna wanna contact the Department of Licensing and Inspections, uh, the numbers on the screen, and that'll be further on as well. Again, in other counties, I'm assuming it's similar and they'll have a licensing office for for landlords that will give you that information. So just some general information for tenants in order to be a better tenant, you wanna make sure to read your lease very carefully before signing. Some leases are very long um, and have a lot of different kinds of things, but you really, but you really wanna make sure that you understand what you're signing because once you sign it, you've agreed to everything that's in that lease. If the landlord sit, talks, if you talk about things and they say, oh yeah, we can do that, no problem. Again, make sure you get everything in writing so that even anything that's an oral promise you wanna have in the lease in writing. Go to the unit ahead of time, check it out. Make sure everything works. Make sure you like the location. Make sure you know things are as they are were explained to you in the ad or that everything is just what, what they were told to you would be. And when you're figuring out what you can afford, remember that often it's not just the amount of rent that you need to make sure that you have. You need to make sure that you have, if, you, if you're paying any of the utilities, if there's a parking fee, if there's an amenity fee, any other kind of extras that might be included, you wanna make sure that you're taking all of that into consideration before you make the decision to rent a property. Just as common, just sort of for informationally, um, once you've signed a lease for the a lease term, a landlord cannot raise the rent during that lease term. They can raise the rent at, you know, at the beginning of a new lease, but for that lease term, the rent is set. 
and really most importantly get renters insurance we recommend that all tenants have renters insurance it's a very cost affordable thing to have and just as an example over christmas you know there were we got the temperatures got very cold in this area and there were a lot of broken pipes and water leaks and things that happened. We heard from a lot of tenants uh, the week after Christmas where they were dealing with uh, the fallout from these water leaks and the pipe burst. And renter's insurance was crucial for those people who needed their property replaced or some of them needed to stay in hotels. Um, the landlord is required if there is you know, a problem, if there is a leak or something else, they are required to fix the structure. They are not required um, to um, deal with the tenant's property. That's what you have renter's insurance for. So what happens if you do have a dispute with your landlord? So hopefully you have a landlords and tenants, you know, have good relationships with each other and are working together. And if you're having an issue, you're able to talk to the landlord or the landlord's able to talk to the tenant and try and work something out. If you do have a disagreement and you come to some sort of resolution of that agree of that disagreement, please get it in writing. You wanna, again, always have everything in writing. And sometimes you wanna have both parties sign an agreement so that it becomes very official and you know, sort of gets connected to the lease. If you're unable to resolve it on your own, that's what our office is for or if you're not in Howard County, you can contact the Maryland Attorney General's office to try and get someone, the service that we offer is a form of mediation where we try and work with the landlords and tenants to see if we can help resolve things to keep them out of court. If your issue is solely a maintenance or habitability issue in Howard County, you're gonna to wanna to contact the Department of Inspections and Licensing. Again, that office licenses landlords and makes sure and makes sure that properties are up to county code. So if there's a problem with the heat or the sewage or the electricity or some sort of thing like that, that's the office that's going to get involved in actually making sure that landlords, again, get the property up to county code. Lastly, as a tenant, you do have the option to file for rent escrow. Rent escrow is a court process where you go to the court if there's a maintenance issue that is not being repaired and you pay, and if the judge agrees with you, you pay your money into the court and the landlord doesn't see the money until the problem is fixed. Rent escrow is for very specific um, big issues. It's for things like heating, electricity, sewage, uh, rodents. Um, I think that's, those are the main, it's for those main big issues. It's not for just a, you know, um, if something just isn't repaired right away that may be uh, in the property, but it's for these big issues with water and electricity and heat and sewage. So that's why you would go to rent escrow. And it is a really good option for tenants if something is not getting fixed. So just quickly, we're gonna talk a little bit about rental scams. In general, rental scams are when somebody tries to rent a property that they don't have the ability to rent. So either they're, they're showing you something that they don't actually own, or they're pretending there's a property and there is no property at all. <clears throat> so they're trying to pose as a landlord uh, to get you to give them your money. So and what happens, unfortunately, then, as within most scams, is that they've gotten your money and all of a sudden you thought you had a place to live and you don't. So you wanna be really careful when you're renting. And we'll talk about some ways to make sure that you keep yourself safe. <clears throat> First off, always request a tour and go to see the property. Um, the scammers don't have access to the property and can't actually let you in. That is the biggest red flag. So, and they'll make up really good stories, give really, um, long convoluted stories about how come they can't let you into the property, but you don't wanna believe the stories. If they can't let you in the property, do not rent from them. When you're looking at listings, especially online, you know, 
there's some that will stand out and you'll think, wow, that's really too good to be true. Look at that. That's a really well-priced property. And my gosh, who would have thought I could get that kind of property for this money or other, any other thing that looks suspicious. Back to the old adage, if it looks too good to be true, it usually is. And if something is below market, that's not a good sign. Um, there's, it's often a good sign that there's a scam going on. Oftentimes, realtors help rent properties. And so when you go to a property, you might see a lockbox that realtors can use to enter the property. And that's fine if it's a realtor, but if it's an owner who doesn't have a key to their own property, that's another red flag. So you want to make sure that you're talking to the owner. When you do go to see a property, make sure that you're talking to the person who has the authority to rent that. If it's an apartment building, you're gonna be talking to the management company. But if it's a private home or a condo, please try and make sure that you're speaking to the, at some point to the property owner. They may have a management company helping them, but they're the landlord and you wanna make sure that you talk to your landlord. Um, and if you can meet them, that's preferable. Um, and this is one way to make sure that you're not being scammed. And finally, don't send money to somebody you don't know. This is the number one scam prevention uh, technique in general, but, and oftentimes scammers are going to request money in odd ways, like they want you to pay by gift card. No legitimate business is going to accept gift card payments. So that's a good red flag. Um, but you wanna really not send money to anyone that you don't know. And if they're giving you a story about how come you need to send them money instead of giving it to them in person um, or working something out when, when you can see them, you wanna really pay attention to that red flag. I know a lot of people do try and rent properties um, if they're moving. And so they're trying to rent them from a distance would highly recommend that you make a trip to the place you're going to be moving to so that you can actually tour the property ahead of time and meet with the landlord or the property management company just to keep yourself safe. So that's a little overview of landlord-tenant law and some advice and tips um, for Howard County. We have these, this is information if your landlord's not making repairs you wanna contact the rental housing inspectors at the Department of Licensing and Inspections, as I've said before. And then our Office of Consumer Protection, if you have complaints, um, that's our phone number there. And oftentimes, unfortunately, there is uh, some fair housing or discrimination issues that you might need assistance with. And if so, that's the Howard County Office of Human Rights. And they help uh, when people feel that there's a that someone isn't abiding by fair housing laws or discriminating against them. If you're not in Howard County, you want to contact your county directly to see whether what services they provide. And also you can contact the Maryland Attorney General's Office for assistance. They offer uh, landlord tenant mediation as well.